So this is part five, module five for their proposal development, part of the five part series for the ANNA research modules developed by the 2020 ANNA Research Committee. I am Amber Paulus, Chair Designee of the 2020 Research Committee for ANNA. So the intention of this five part series is to provide education to any level of nurse interested in doing research, things that you would need to know in building a research study and how to submit for an ANA grant. This specific module covers an overview of ANA guidelines for submitting a clinical practice grant, research grant, or evidence-based practice grant, and more information can be found about those uh, grant mechanisms at the link on this slide. The objectives of this part five module is to understand the ANA guidelines for research proposal submission and understand how to submit the clinical practice grant, research grant, or evidence-based practice grant. So there are three types of grants through ANNA that are available uh, for submission of a specific study. The first is the evidence-based practice grant. This grant is meant to fund nurses who want to translate research into practice. So research that already exists that you want to replicate or address a specific issue um, that there's already literature available on how to solve that problem. Uh, it's demonstrating the value of nephrology nursing and improving patient outcomes. This is a $5,000 grant available. Uh, the second one is a clinical practice grant, also known as the Barbara F. Powerant grant. And it's a research study led by a nurse, specifically one who is certified by the Nephrology Nurse Certification Commission. So uh, CNN, CDN, uh, and who is in graduate school. So you're working on a master's level degree or PhD or direct doctorate level degree, DNP also. Uh, and the amount is $5,000. And the last one is the research proposal, a full scale research study in the amount of $15,000. So when you're considering applying for these grants, you should know your audience when you're writing a specific research study um, submission. So align your project with the defined research priorities. ANA does not specifically define priorities that they're interested in funding, but their priorities align with what is happening in the nephrology community. So right now there is a lot of attention placed on modalities through the Advancing American Kidney Health Executive Order. We know that there is a push to get more patients on home dialysis or receiving a kidney transplant. So that is certainly a priority of ANA as well. Um, consider who might be reviewing your proposal. So the research committee actually reviews all proposals and makes recommendations to the board. It is known knowledge who is on that committee. You can find it on the ANA website and then know the evaluation criteria. On the grant uh, link that I had on the first slide, there is criteria listed for each grant mechanism and we'll cover that in this module. Also consider the first impressions of your proposal. Be sure that the title is clear, that someone can read the title and really know what the study is going to be about, that the abstract is has enough details where if it were to be a movie reel, that you would be interested in actually reading that. Uh, and the specific, specific aims are the actual movie trailer. So this is going to help us understand all facets of the proposed research study. So some steps associated with the ANA grant process, these, the specific dates sometimes fluctuate, but it almost always happens in these months every single year. So the first proposals are typically due by August 31st. This is an option to get feedback on a study from the research committee uh, so that you can tailor uh, where you might have gaps or something might not be clear, or if you even have questions and you're not sure that um, the study actually aligns with uh, ANNA's funding mechanisms. You know, if you were proposing for an evidence-based practice grant, and we were like, mm, that kind of sounds more like this particular mechanism, those recommendations can be made through this process, uh, but it's not required. This is an optional uh, thing that you can do to get some feedback on your study. And then the committee provides feedback, usually a, a month later, uh, September 30th for this past year. And so you get that feedback, Again, it's optional, and then you submit the final proposal, and usually in the middle of November, uh, and then award notification happens just before the National Symposium, which happens every spring, and it will also be announced at the National Symposium. So how to get research grants funded? You have to have good science. So there has to be a clear hypothesis if you're actually doing an interventional study. 
again, you can do, you can propose for descriptive studies or exploratory studies, uh, but if there is a hypothesis component, it should be sound and clear and have a very specific, well-detailed approach. How are you going to approach solving the problem that you've proposed? The other thing is to practice good marketing skills. So if you're doing research, a lot of that is, is considering how to market it to somebody who might not know a lot about that specific topic. And it should have a well-written proposal that is responsive to the actual instructions that ANA puts out for grant submission guidelines. Some common reasons that proposals go unfunded, a lot of it is failing to apply. So not a lot of people know that there are grant mechanisms out there specifically tailored to nephrology nurses that ANA supplies or funds. Uh, so failing to apply is the, is the primary reason why things go unfunded. Uh, lack of new ideas, so not just like replicating something that's already been done. That is something that we obviously have the evidence-based practice grant for, um, but having new ideas, things that are novel, things that haven't been, uh, if you're solving a problem that is an ongoing problem, like increase in the use of home dialysis modalities, what is a novel way to approach that? Having an unfocused research plan, meaning that it's poorly written or it's not really responsive to the direction of the program. Um, so just not following basic guidelines that are that are in the actual grant submission guidelines um, and just not being clear about what the actual purpose of the study is. Uh, lack of knowledge of published relevant work, meaning that there was clearly not a strong literature review. Uh, it was more of a let's do this grant, let's get this money. Um, it should kind of follow that cyclical process of we really have researched this topic, we have a good understanding, and then the grant will flow from there. A uh, lack of essential scientific experience. Uh, this is this is probably if you're going for very very rigorous grants, um, something from the funded by the NIH. Uh, ANA is actually open to funding anyone, whether you have a lot of experience or a little experience. Um, there can be some mentorship through um, leading research if it's needed or if the submitter is interested in that kind of thing. So I wouldn't say that this is directly um, relevant to a and grants, um, future directions of the research. So while you're applying for the specific grant to do this very specific study, uh, it's always good to know what will happen next after that. Um, it's very easy to consider funding something where you know that it's not just gonna be this one thing and done, that it's going to lead to this trajectory. A uh, questionable experimental approach. So if you're doing an experimental study, maybe a randomized control trial, it should be sound. It should be very clear that there was some protection between a control and the intervention group, that that's very well described. Uh, having an unrealistic scope of work. So all grants require um, a, to be done in a specific timeline. If the work feels like the scope is so large that's not feasible, um, that could lead to not being funded. Lack of experimental detail, so being very specific about what's going to be done in the actual study, or limited funding available. So there was a lot of grant submissions, it's very competitive, and so somebody had to not get funded. Um, but that's always the opportunity to either take that submission somewhere else and get funding uh, or reapply the following year. So you should always start with defining your goals. They have to be specific, measurable, and realistic when you're writing a uh, grant proposal. Uh, and then also consider the eligibility requirements. So there are specific requirements that you must meet in order to apply for a grant. First of all, they have to all be applied for. So a and &A would never reach out and say, hey, we have this money, do you want to do a study? Uh, it has to be something that's submitted for. The, province, the principal investigator must also be a full member of a and &A for the entire duration of the research project. The primary principal investigator or PI must also be a registered nurse and have a minimum of a master's degree. So you can have a research team, like maybe you have a nephrologist that's working with you or a physician's assistant or a dietitian or social worker, but the primary lead of the study must be a registered nurse. If two or more individuals are applying as co-investigators, they must all be members of ANNA for the duration of the project and at least one being a full member and others being full or associate members. So remember that you can be a member of ANNA and not be a nurse. And those are called associate members and that is allowed as long as the PI is a registered nurse. Well, I guess in a co-investigator in instance, there is not a centralized PI, but one of them must be a registered nurse and full member of a and Actively involved in nephrology nursing related healthcare practices and services. So if it's, it's someone who's not necessarily practicing in nephrology and is interested in doing a study, it needs to align with nephrology nursing. 
Investigators must share equal responsibility for the conceptualization and implementation of the proposed research project and provide evidence of experience and credentials demonstrating the ability to complete the research project and commitment to nephrology nursing. The project may be a new endeavor, but it can also be something that's already in progress, but other funding sources must be disclosed. So when you're actually getting into developing the proposal, there are specific requirements that ANNA ask be addressed. Uh, it, the applicability of the investigation to nephrology, transplant, or related therapy. So has to be in the scope of nephrology. It couldn't be something testing the impact on cardiovascular disease. It's to be relevant to kidney-related um, healthcare services. Have a relationship to the nephrology nursing scope and standards of practice have sound methodology in accordance with recognized nursing research guidelines, be approved by an institutional review board or be determined exempt. And there are several NIH websites that will help you walk through that process. If, are you doing human subject research? Is it exempt? And then it would be exempt through an institutional review board, but it is always wise just to go through the IRB process so that you're for sure that you're doing exempt research have strong feasibility and likelihood that it's going to be successfully completed, have a detailed budget for the proposed project, uh, and it should outline that the costs that exceed the grant amount are defined. Um, so if you're only getting a $5,000 grant and you need more money than that, it should be detailed where that money's coming from and what it's for. Uh, and indirect costs can be included in a budget, but a and does not fund indirect costs. These are things like overhead, you know, like facilities that exist that you may use would be an indirect cost. A direct cost is something that you have to have to do the study. Um, like if you're doing a study that had to use iPads for patient education, well, in order to do the study, you would need the iPad. So that's a direct cost. Indirect would be like the facility that you're going to be doing the study in. AMA is not paying for that, that type of overhead. So the actual components for an AMA grant include a cover letter, a cover sheet, uh, defining who the people on the study are, co-investigator, consultant, collaborator, and each team member should be identified what their contribution to the team is going to be, listing their expertise, how it'll facilitate the completion of the research study, uh, the budget sheet, which should include all details of every single item listed, you know, why is it needed, what's the purpose, what's the amount, um, how much of it do you need, um, like if you were doing the iPad study, how many iPads do you need and how, how much does each one of those cost. The application checklist. This is um, this lists everything that you need for the grant to submit, and so it's meant to be not just like something you go in and check off, but you really look at it and say, "Yes, I have a cover letter. Yes, my cover sheet is done," um, and it's evidence that you've actually reviewed the entire packet you're submitting for a proposal to ensure it's in compliance with the application requirements. That you have a detailed timetable and it should include information from the beginning to the end of the project. So, like I was saying, if something's already been in process, the timetable should still include details of what's already occurred. And then when ANA funding would come into the project, you would define that on your timetable. Having an abstract research plan, all of your references, you can have appendices, having a copy of your IRB approval, the actual CVs or curriculum vitae of the co-investigator or consultant or collaborator that's relevant to the study, um, attaching personal research articles. So if it's something that you have already investigated previously, adding that into your submission pack packet helps the reviewers kind of see holistically your research uh, program and how the study would you know, support that. And then a professional headshot, which is used if you are um, awarded the grant uh, and you know, you're recognized at the National Symposium. So breaking this down to the specific requirements of, of what's included in the components, the cover letter, it's indicating how the applicant or applicants meet the eligibility criteria. You're identifying if you have other funding sources for which funds this project have been requested, um, specifying whether or not a decision regarding funding has been made and if it's favorable, the monetary amount and period of funding. So all of that you're including in this cover letter uh, and it basically saying why ANA would be a great um, funder for that particular study. Second thing is a cover sheet. This is an actual document that ANA puts out there and you would retrieve it from the website when you are putting your packet together. Uh, it's going to ask basic information about the specific study. So the name of the study, 
how long it's going to last to so the dates of the project, who the people are doing the study, and some contact information for them, that they have an ANA uh, membership and when does it expire, that they have a nursing license and from what state, uh, that the institutions or the address and locations are going to be uh, conducted, um, that you have the appropriate degree, that you have other funding from somewhere else, and then you're going to sign saying that you understand that everything you've listed is true information. And then the co-investigator, consultant, collaborator sheet. Uh, this is also basic information about who those people are, including if they have a nursing license, an ANA membership, and basic contact information for those folks. The next thing is the budget sheet. So it should include an addendum that provides justification for all items that are on that budget sheet. Why is it important? How much do things cost? Um, the be used to cover expenses heard in conducting search, um, but it's not limited to. So these are some examples of things it can cover. So the investigator salary, a research assistant, secretarial support, equipment, supplies, data entry, and consultants. These are just examples. It's not everything. Um, indirect costs for conducting research cannot um, be funded. They can be included, but the money can't be used for those things. Um, up to $500 in travel costs will be reimbursed by ANA for an oral presentation um, at the National Symposium. Uh, the amount of the budget request should not exceed $15,000. Now, this is for the actual grant, uh, research grant, the $15,000 grant. So the budget should not exceed more than that. If additional funding is needed to complete the study, indicate the source of the funding and address the contingencies for failure to receive additional funding. So the idea here is that if that additional funding did not come through and say ANA chose to fund that particular grant, then that would be a contingency, meaning like the study couldn't be done because the additional money didn't come through. So you would have to say, this is our plan. You know, this is how we would rework the study if you know the additional money did not come through from this other source. And that needs to be well articulated on the budget sheet. This is an example of what the budget sheet looks like. You can break it down by personnel. Uh, supplies, equipment, and then travel, but not including the travel costs associated with like traveling to present at the National Symposium. Uh, and then including, you know, what are the total indirect costs that might be incurred by the study that ANA is not going to fund. And then the checklist. So the actual um, checklist is, there's a screenshot of it here, uh, making sure that you have all the components that we're going through here. It also gives you some examples of what to include, like in an abstract or the budget, um, and checking off they completed those things. This is what the second page looks like. This is getting down into the research plan. Things to include, include in each specific topic uh, and the components of that topic, down to the problem statement, uh, specific aims, hypotheses, literature review, um, the research design and methods, looking at uh, procedures, and then including your actual timetable. So this covers information for the beginning of the project. And this is just an example. So in this table, that IRB approval will be um, gained in month one, sampling for the study from months two to three, then data collection starts months four to eight, uh, and then data analysis and publications is months 10 to 12. And so it lasts a full year for the study to be completed. The abstract, so it has to be limited to 250 words, which is pretty standard for most abstracts, include a problem statement, purpose, overall aims, and methodology. And then the biggest piece of the component, or biggest component of the research study submission is the research plan. It has to be 12 double spaced pages. Keep in, find, keep in mind the following questions. What do you intend to do? Why is that work important? What has already been done by you or other investigators? And how are you going to do the work? So that how are you going to do the work is the methodology of the actual research plan. So breaking it down into specifics that you have a problem statement that the problem has been stated to be investigated and why the study is important. And is it a problem that can be addressed by nurses? So this is really important because you're seeking funding from a nephrology, a nephrology nursing organization. It has to be a problem that nurses can address. So if it was, um, prescribing certain medications and a registered nurse is going to lead that study, not an advanced practice nurse. Well, that's not in their scope of practice. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense uh, that that was the actual proposed uh, intervention um, or like doing a surgical procedure. Well, not often that nurses do surgical procedures. So uh, it has to be in the scope of nursing practice. 
questions to be addressed, that you're delineating the hypothesis or key research questions to be addressed by the study. Remember that it can be a study that's not deploying an intervention, so it might not have a hypothesis, but it should still have a key research question that's going to be addressed. Then the specific aims that they're concisely written, um, that they have short and long-term aims or the objective of the research, and it's outlined in an anticipated timetable for the achievement of the aims so they can happen within a year period of time. Uh, the specific aims very, um, very directly is the cornerstone of the entire research proposal. So this should be extremely clear so that the reviewers understand the actual trajectory of the proposed study. What do you want to accomplish? What is the objective? That this is the master plan of your research. Uh, it's not unusual for some members of the study section to read only the specific aims and project summary before they start to score the actual um, submission. It should be um, not dense or full of jargon, it should not be poorly written. Um, that's not gonna help the scoring of proposal. Uh, even if you actually have sound science for the, re like your method methodology is totally sound, it's appropriate. If your specific aims are not clear, then there's a disconnect there. Um, and so it's gonna be hard for a funder to say, yep, this study is great, let's move ahead with this one. Um, is a useful summary for obtaining early feedback on your proposal. So if you're going to submit early for that August deadline and get feedback, on your actual study and you're not sure that your, your specific aims are strong or clear, you can ask for feedback very directly on that piece of your study. Uh, includes project milestones, hypotheses to be tested, all the key aspects of your project, including, including what is important and exciting without the very granular details, like this is how we're going to do it. Um, aim for an unmet scientific need, um, meaning that you've identified the gap and the study is going to address that gap and then be crystal clear in your writing. You can also provide a conceptual framework, um, which the reviewers can hang the details of what will be done on. And that's gonna come just after the specific aims, uh, but you may say your specific aim is going to be um, to use that conceptual model to address the problem, you know, without getting into the, the greener details of the components of the conceptual model, but can be something that you are going to employ in your research study. So following specific aims, you're gonna have background and significance. This is gonna be where your literature review um, really shines. This um, is meant to present proposal critically uh, evaluating the existing knowledge and specifically identifying the gaps that the project is going to fill, provide a brief or theoretical conceptual framework for the study. Like I just described, you might mention the specific aims and get very granular here. Uh, explain the potential importance of the proposed work and identify any unique ideas of potential contributions to nephrology nursing that might result from this study. Uh, you also can provide a brief overview of the preliminary studies you've done on the topic um, or that you have participated in that are relevant to that actual proposal. And then the bulk of the work will be around the research design and methods. Um, so 12 pages, those first two components, specific aims should only be about a page background, maybe a page, page and a half, but this piece of the work is, is going to take several pages of that 12 page uh, limit. So you're gonna describe the research design and procedures to be used to accomplish the specific aims. Remember your analysis should tie back to what your actual aims are. Describe the subjects, including the number and rationale for sampling size. You can also put a um, power analysis in there. Um, for quantitative studies uh, or approach to data saturation for qualitative studies, meaning that once you've hit a thematic saturation and you're going to stop um, recruiting participants for your qualitative study. And then for quantitative studies, you're gonna describe the key variables, independent, dependent, or predictor, describe any instruments that will be used, including their reliability, validity, provide copies of the instrument, instruments in the appendix. So like if you're going to do, say you're going to evaluate in the dialysis practice setting, and you're going to use one of the AHRQ culture of safety um, tools, you need to identify the reliability and validity of that specific tool, survey tool. Also, you're going to identify the psychometric or biometric considerations or consultations planned, include how the data will be collected, analyzed, interpreted, include the actual data management procedures, meaning like where is it going to be stored, who is going to have access to the data, if you're using a qualitative methodology, be specific about explaining the data collection and analysis. Remember qualitative has a lot of free text. And so be very clear about how you're going to interpret that text, address the feasibility of conducting and completing the study, meaning um, 
are there going to be enough available patients, how you uh, maintain contact with patients over a long period of time, the percent return of mail items. So if you're doing some kind of survey that requires mailing, what happens if nobody responds to that mailing? How are you going to keep trying to make contact with your participants? And then present the information that will convince the reviewers that the study will be completed, meaning that if this money is awarded, they want to know that there's going to be a return on that investment, that it's actually feasible that it's going to be done. Include the proposed timetable for the study in detail from the beginning to the completion of the project and identify any potential limitations or difficulties related to the proposed study. What the reviewers want to see is that you've already thought about everything that could go wrong and you have a contingency plan for that so that you can be flexible, right? So if, if something were like... COVID-19 happens and you have to move, say you're gonna do focus groups for a qualitative study and you were gonna do those in person, but then COVID-19 hit and we can't do anything in person anymore. So how will you adapt and move into a virtual environment would be a great example of how um, to present limitations and difficulties and, and contingency plans that you have to overcome those. Another big thing is deciding whether or not you're going to be doing research that includes human subjects or animal subjects. For both of these things, they need to go through IRB. You need to provide evidence that IRB approval has been obtained and um, that you, that is for human subject research, the researchers have completed certification for human um, protection of human subjects. And there's an NIH training for that link listed on this slide. Uh, ANA also requires a consent form for all nursing research unless a waiver of consent has been granted by the IRB. So you would include that in your appendices. Uh, the actual consent form that you would have participants sign to participate in your study. Also, um, if approval has not been obtained, like you haven't, say that maybe your organization doesn't have an IRB, um, like my organization does not, and so you're going to use an IRB that is, it costs money to get approved. Uh, you, you can write in your study that approval will be obtained if the study is funded. Um, but funds will not be dispersed from ANA until that approval is obtained. Same thing with animal subjects. Um, if a laboratory animal is going to be any part of this study, you have to state species, strains, ages, and number of animals being used, provide the rationale to why you're going to use that specific animal, um, provide evidence um, that this study has been approved, uh, all the procedures that will be done on the animals and precautions that are going to be taken to assure that you know, they have great care and the comfort of the animals is prioritized. Um, also the same kind of deal. If approval hasn't been obtained from IRB before um, the actual initiation of the study um, or funding of the study, ANA will withhold funds until all of that has been done. Uh, investigators who are affiliated with institution, institutions who do not have established IRVs um, can obtain a review of the proposal by another review board agency at another location. So this means like you can you can get IRB approval from a company who who just does IRB, uh, and those are out there um, for you to research and make sure that you have someone that is actually certified to do that. And finally, your references. So you should follow a standard standard format, preferably APA, the sixth edition. This is for um, submission of a paper for possible publication in the nephrology nursing journal. But when you're doing your proposal, APA format should be used when you're doing like your background section that's going to have a lot of literature in there um, and, and possibly throughout your proposal if you're using a conceptual framework or a conceptual model or using methods that have been used elsewhere, you're going to cite all of those in APA. Um, there's no page limit for this actual reference section, but they should reflect all relevant and current literature. It doesn't need to be exhaustive. So like including things you didn't actually use in your proposal is not relevant, um, just things that you've actually used. And then your appendices. So uh, this, you identify them like A, B, C, or et cetera, you know, as you start to add things in, like your consent form, you know, A, B, C, um, or any tools that you're going to use and make references to these throughout your proposal, have a copy of your IRB approval. Again, you can say on this specific component will be obtained if funded by ANA, and then you would have to provide that if funded. Curriculum B-Day, so this should be a CV for the PI and all co-investigators, collaborators, consultants. Um, the PI must include reprints or copies of at least one, but not more than three research articles from projects that you have completed. Uh, and relevant personal research articles, like I just said, and then a headshot, eight by 10 headshot included as well. So how does this mission procedure actually go? 
So all project proposals are actually submitted by email to the national office at this particular um, email. The proposal will then be forwarded to the appropriate reviewers. It will go from there to the research committee for review. Uh, it's a good suggestion to request a delivery receipt, meaning that once it's opened and from that email, you are notified. And so if you don't receive that confirmation within three days, it's okay to contact the national office to make sure it's actually gone through the interwebs and made its way to the, the right location. Um, and if you have difficulty emailing the proposal, it's also always necessary to contact the national office because um, they are willing to help you to make sure that your proposal gets through. And then the expectations of a recipient. So for procedural expectations that the appropriate institutional review board has reviewed the study prior to ANA distributing any funds. Um, you will also submit quarterly reports to the research committee chair at the national office. Uh, and these happen on the first of each of these months, August, November, and February, and May, regarding the progress of the research until the project has been successfully completed. Um, also, reporting of any adverse events have to be done immediately to the research committee chair and the membership services coordinator at the national office. It's pretty rare that this would happen, but of course, uh, it's something that has to be done if it were to occur. As far as financial expectations, the recipient will sign a grant recipient agreement form prior to the first payment being distributed from the ANA office. This is 50% of the awarded amount, and then it will come in 25% balances from there going forward. Um, upon satisfactory submission of the actual quarterly progress reports, this is the February report, and then the final 25% upon su successful completion of the project and submission of the final financial reconciliation of project expenditures. So all funds will be payable and sent to the institution that is managing or overseeing the research project as a recipient. So the grant would not be sent to Amber Paulus. It would be sent to my organization and then you can work out how that would be paid out from there. The recipient will use the funds to cover the approved expenses incurred in conducting the research and that these expenses may include but are not necessarily limited to some of the examples I gave before. So researcher salary, research assistance, secretary of support, equipment supplies, consultant assistance, and then publication costs. To publish an NNNJ, you're not gonna get a fee for that. Um, and that is actually a requirement of funded um, research through ANA. But if you were to publish somewhere else, it might be something you would have to consider. And then again, indirect costs will not be funded for the actual project. And then upon completion of the project, you'll submit a final financial reconciliation showing all the project expenditures since the beginning of the award when the grant was originally dispersed. Uh, anything greater than $100 will be accompanied by documentation, so receipts or invoices paid. So here's the expectation for timeline. The project is expected to be completed within 12 months of the first disbursement of funds. Should more time be needed, you have to make a formal request to the research committee chair prior to the completion of the 12-month period. So you can't hit that last month and then say, oh, this didn't get done. Uh, it has to be, you know, along the way. You're keeping open lines of communication with the research committee that the study is actually being completed. In this COVID-19 era, we've seen a lot of that where things were going to happen in person and they had to be moved to a virtual environment. So there's always, you know, negotiation is always opportunity. You just have to be communicate, be communicating that ahead of time. Be proactive always. And then as far as dissemination, submitting a paper for possible publication, nephrology nursing journal within 12 months following the final disbursement of funds, submitting a proposal for possible formal presentation of the research findings at the national symposium when the research analysis is complete. Um, the proposal must be submitted according to the schedule provided by the conference committee in the fall following the final fund disbursement. So there's always a national symposium in the spring and then there's another one in the fall, uh, which is, um, nephrology practice uh, conference. So one of those two things are you should consider presenting at. Um, I think they do like to have it at the National Symposium every spring though, so that it happens kind of right after the project would be completed. Then complimentary, complimentary registration will be provided at the National Symposium in which you're going to be presenting your study uh, for oral presentations only. Um, in addition to the grant amount of $500 in travel cost and will re be reimbursed by ANA. Poster presentations are not included in this reimbursement. Um, you have to be doing an oral presentation. Oral presentations in any other venue must be approved in advance by ANA. This is actually in the grant agreement. So you're signing when you do that. I'm going to present this exclusively at ANA. And if you were to choose to present it somewhere else like ASN, AKF, 
you would need approval from a and to do so. Any publication of the study findings must be including the following statements. This is standard if you receive grants from anywhere um, that the grant that the study was supported by a grant made possible by the a and American Nephrology Nurse Association, and that findings of the study do not necessarily reflect the opinions of ANNA, the views expressed herein are of the author, and no official endorsement by ANNA is intended or should be inferred. So, uh, standard um, contingency clause to include when you get grant grants from anywhere. And the references for this particular module, and that concludes module five on submitting proposals uh, for grant funding from ANNA.